Welcome back everyone to another episode of The Road Chose Me. My name's Dan, and on today's episode, a question you've all been asking lots about, what about driving a modern diesel around the world? So the build on the Jeep is continuing. I've got a ton more videos to show you on that. But for today's topic, there's a lot of questions about dirty diesel, about DEF, about diesel particulate filters, about reliability, durability, all these questions about driving a modern diesel to undeveloped parts of the world. If this is something you're wondering about, I'd love to get your input as well. Stick around, let's go through all of the topics right now. Before we get too far into it, I have to explain what I mean when I say modern diesel engine, like the one here in my Wrangler. And so in about 2007, all the countries in the world, they realized that the diesel we were burning and the particulates that we were putting into the environment, they were pretty bad for us health-wise. And so countries started mandating what they called ultra low sulfur diesel. Basically diesel that has very, very little sulfur in it, something like five parts per million, very, very low. Previous to that, diesel something like 2,000 parts per million. What that meant is that car manufacturers had to change the way the diesel engines were made. They had to add all this extra complicated emissions equipment. They changed the way the diesel injection pumps worked. Basically, things got a lot more complicated. So when I say modern diesel, I mean newer than about 2007. If you can get a diesel engine prior to that, Typically they're mechanical, so there's no computer. They have none of this emission stuff we're about to talk about. And those engines, they are phenomenal for driving around Africa, driving through Latin America or Central Asia. Old Land Cruisers, old Land Rovers, anything from the 80s, the 90s, even the early 2000s. They're basically tractors, they're indestructible, they will burn anything. And yes, those are excellent. And that is a very great choice. And you can pretty much ignore everything I'm about to talk about. Same goes if you've got a gas vehicle, even a new modern fuel injected one, it doesn't have the same level of complexity that this engine does here. So really all I'm talking about is very new diesel engines. From about 2007, they started adding things like diesel particulate filters. And then somewhere around 2015, 2018, lots of manufacturers started requiring diesel exhaust fluid or add blue it's sometimes called. And that's like the latest level of complexity Euro, Euro 6 is the equivalent in Europe. So that's what I mean. And you can see here, this engine, three liter eco diesel from Jeep. This is the same engine they've been putting in the Ram 1500 for about 10 years now. It's been in the Grand Cherokee for quite a while. And it's actually Italian made, made by Via Motori, who did previously make the export diesel in the Wrangler, the 2.8 liter four cylinder. Although that engine shares nothing in common with this one. And for all you Chevy fans out there, here's a fun fact. The new Duramax 2.8 that's in the Chevy Colorado, that is the Vio Motori 2.8 four-cylinder diesel that is in the export Wrangler from 2008 to 2018. So that engine is actually quite old and Jeep themselves never made it legal for the US, but for whatever reason, Chevy decided to. Same engine, same part numbers. Anyway, that's what I mean when I say modern diesel engine. So to start things off, we're over here at the fuel filler because this vehicle, you don't just put diesel in it, you also have to put diesel exhaust fluid into this Jeep. So the emission system is so complicated that it has a whole system where it injects this special fluid onto the exhaust to try and burn off some of the nasty gases. And so that fluid, diesel exhaust fluid, sometimes it's called Ad Blue, you have to put it in Supposedly the tank in this is good for 10,000 miles. People say when you do a lot of off-roading though, it probably lasts about half that long. And if you don't put it in, if you run the tank out, the computer will actually refuse to start the engine. So it's a must, without it, you're not going anywhere. And a lot of people think that once you go international, you're not going to be able to buy diesel exhaust fluid. And well, that's basically not true. And so that's the first myth that I wanna dispel. Basically, all of Europe, all of Australia, friends have recently been through Central and South America, all of those places, no problem at all buying diesel exhaust fluid or add blue. Lots of places in Africa as well, all of Southern Africa, virtually all of Eastern Africa, you're just going to be able to buy it quite normally. It's not going to be complicated. Obviously, things are gonna be a bit different if you go to a country like the Congo or somewhere really remote. But what I learned when I was in those countries 
is that there is always someone, some ambassador or some really rich guy who's importing things that you wouldn't think would be there. For example, a Porsche whipped by me doing high speed when I was in the Congo. Yes, there are Porsches, there are 19 inch tires, there are 20 inch tires. Lots of people think you can't get those types of things in undeveloped places, but you actually can. So my thought with diesel exhaust fluid is, you're gonna have to be a bit careful, make sure you're always keeping the tank well above half full, maybe even carry some spare with you, just to make sure that if you do get to a country that doesn't have it, you can either hunt out the ambassador or hunt out the rich guy that can get it for you, or you'll have enough range, you can just go to the next country and get it there. So for me, I don't actually see buying the DEF fluid as a limiting factor in terms of taking this around the world. One more thing to add on that too, you can actually just buy urea crystals. And it turns out DEF fluid, it's 67% water and only the rest is this active ingredient called urea. There's nothing to stop you buying the crystals, carrying them around, just a small little container of it. And if you really got stuck and couldn't buy any, you could mix up your own with water and fill the tank, get you another 10,000 miles. That would be a last resort for me, but actually I think it would work and I think DEF fluid is not really the concern. So if the DEF fluid isn't a problem, then what is the major problem? And that is what a lot of people just refer to as dirty diesel. And you might think that dirty diesel just refers to there's physically contaminants in the diesel. That isn't what we mean, we'll get to that in a second. But yes, dirty diesel is a problem. And in fact, dirty gasoline is as well. Plenty of countries, Nigeria, Cameroon, I could see there was black goo or there were floaties or there were just nasty things in the fuel that I was burning. So without a doubt, if you're going to undeveloped parts of the world, you should definitely add an extra fuel filter and you should definitely add a water separator. That's whether you've got an old diesel, an old gas engine, modern vehicles, add those anyway as an extra layer of security, carry with you an extra fuel filter, you're going to be really happy if you do get a tank that's been sitting you know, on the bottom of the big distribution tank for a month and you suck up all of those nasties, filter those out before they even get to your engine. That's preventative measure number one. But when people commonly say dirty diesel, what they actually mean is that high sulfur diesel we were talking about previously. And this is basically what all diesel was back in the day. But these days, all developed countries, they only sell ultra low sulfur but there are plenty of countries around the world that simply don't. So if you go to the Congo, if you go to Egypt, you're only going to get very high sulfur diesel. And the annoying thing about sulfur in diesel is you can't filter it out. There is no filtration system, there is no separator that you can add to your engine or to your fuel system that will actually remove it. So that sulfur, it's going to go through your injection pump, it's going to go into the cylinder, you'll burn it and it'll wind up in the hole exhaust emission system. And the problem there is basically, and the reason they took it out is because it makes so many more particulates. There's really nasty sooty things in the exhaust. And this exhaust has a thing called a diesel particulate filter, which is designed to remove those nasties. So inevitably that diesel particulate filter, it's going to get clogged up with all those nasties. And it's going to get clogged up a lot faster and a lot more than it was ever designed to be. Is that a major problem? Probably. The vast majority of people that drive modern diesel engines into the undeveloped world, the computer shuts them down fairly quickly and says, no, I'm not having this. My filter keeps getting too clogged. And the computer does have strategies to deal with that. It puts more fuel in, it runs things hotter, it tries to burn the filter out, which hopefully will work, but it's never designed for the ultra high sulfur diesel. And it's just gonna be more particulates in there than it was ever designed to handle. Same thing when you go downstream, you've got the whole selective catalyst reduction system. That's the whole system that uses the DEF fluid. That's a big complicated thing that injects that liquid into the exhaust stream. Again, that's going to get clogged up in ways that it was never designed to be used or to be clogged. So basically what we're saying is, if you put dirty diesel through this engine, chances are you're going to start clogging up the whole emission system. The computer's gonna freak out and not like it. More than likely, the computer's just gonna shut it down and say, no, we're not going anywhere. The engine will refuse to run. That is the real problem with driving a modern diesel engine around the world. So how big of a problem is it actually? 
Well, it turns out the United Nations put out a report every year on diesel quality around the world. And here's the report, it just came out in June of 2023. And so this shows you what countries in the world have ultra low sulfur diesel, which is 15 parts per million or less, and then which countries have all ranges up to insanely bad quality diesel. And you can see, just like so many things in the world, the situation is actually better than most people assume it to be. And like everything, things are improving really fast. A few years ago, I did a video and I said, don't drive a modern diesel engine around the world. Things have changed quite a bit since then. There are a lot of countries that have now moved to ultra low sulfur diesel. Mexico being a great example, every Pemex in the whole country sells ultra low sulfur diesel. So you can see based on this map, all of North America, all of Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, all basically developed countries that have ultra low sulfur diesel. That map even shows all of Russia. It shows quite a bit of Central Asia as I could drive this there right now and not have a single problem. So that's really good news. And I think that is a better situation than most people were assuming. As for the countries that don't have ultra low sulfur diesel, that's where it starts to become a gamble and how much will the filters get clogged? How quickly will they get clogged? And will the computer just freak out or will it be able to deal with that scenario? Another problem with the high sulfur in the diesel is that inevitably some of that sulfur and some of those particulates, they're going to get into the engine oil. You get a little bit of a blow by, things like that. And what that does is it reduces the effectiveness of the engine oil. So basically it just doesn't lubricate in the way that it's supposed to. And for anyone wondering, that's why this engine has such insanely specific requirements for the engine oil that it needs. They have to meet some really specific standard. And that standard basically is about how well does the oil still perform, even if there's a lot of these particulates and a lot of sulfur that has found its way into the engine oil. And actually the computer is monitoring that as well. And that's why the computer will tell you when you're due for an oil change. Fingers crossed, if you were driving somewhere with higher sulfur than this was really designed for, the computer would know that, the computer would see the filters are getting clogged more often than normal, and it would tell you that you need to change your oil more often. And in fact, that really is the advice. If you go to countries with high sulfur diesel, change the engine oil twice as often as required. So the book on this says to change the oil every 10,000 miles. If I was driving into undeveloped countries, I would be changing the oil every 5,000 miles without a doubt, just to try and help the engine deal with that high sulfur diesel. So after all of that, you're probably saying, Dan, stop rambling and just delete it and be done with it. And well, yes, but also no. So let me back up a bit and explain for those that don't know. When people say delete it, what they mean is get rid of all of that emission stuff. And so typically that means you basically put a straight exhaust from the back of the turbo all the way back, no diesel particulate filter, no SCR system, no DEF, which means I could delete the tank and put a nice big fat auxiliary diesel tank back there. That'd be a nice benefit. And as well as removing all the physical hardware, you also have to get a computer reflash so that you basically disable or delete or remove all of that stuff from the computer. And yes, absolutely, that can be done. It can be done on this. There is a company not too far away from me that can do it, no problem at all. But of course, like everything, it comes with its own downsides and it isn't necessarily the silver bullet that people assume it to be. So the first problem with just deleting the emissions is that it is illegal, basically in every jurisdiction, especially in the US now. And you might say, yeah, Dan, you're going international, so it doesn't really matter. Well, there's a quirk when you temporarily import your vehicle around the world, whether you use a Carnet de Passage or a temporary import permit, your vehicle has to stay legally registered and insured in its home jurisdiction. So if you do a modification to your vehicle that actually makes it illegal in its home jurisdiction, technically you're not allowed to temporarily import it around the world. Probably I would get away with it. Although having a vehicle that's illegal who knows what would happen for insurance claims? Who knows what would happen if you got in a crash? It's not really something that I would like to do or that I'm willing to do. The next downside to deleting it is that it's really expensive. On this engine, I think it's about $3,000 by the time you buy the straight exhaust, by the time you get the computer reflash and all of that. That's a lot of money 
to basically remove a bunch of stuff. Another downside that I really don't like or it doesn't sit well with me is basically the damage that I would be doing to the environment. You know, this was designed to hopefully do less damage to the environment than old diesel engines did. And if I just get rid of all that emission stuff, I'm just putting all those bad chemicals out into the atmosphere. And I don't really want to do that. That's not great for the planet. It is hard though, I struggle to reconcile it because I know I could have just gone and bought, let's say like a 2000 model Dodge pickup with a big 6BT Cummins in it, big diesel engine. And that thing has no emissions of any kind. That would just be spewing out the exhaust who knows what. And that's perfectly legal. I can register that and drive that around all day long. Probably if I delete this, this would actually be less bad for the environment than buying one of those big diesel engines. So it's a complicated thing. I would be making it worse for the environment than it is right now, but it would be better for the environment than had I just bought an old diesel engine. So I kind of struggle with that one a little bit. And the final downside to deleting it, and I think this is something that a lot of people don't consider, is that it isn't a magic silver bullet that just solves all of your problems. So remember, you're still going to be burning this high sulfur diesel. Nobody really knows what that'll do to the high pressure injection pump on these modern engines. This is actually already under an active recall from Jeep. I need to get a new injection pump as soon as Jeep have parts. But if you run high sulfur diesel through it, it was never designed for it. What's gonna happen? Nobody really knows. Same story for the injectors. Are they going to clog? Are they going to somehow get all little bits of stuff stuck in them? Again, nobody really knows because not many people have done it or are doing it with engines this modern. So I think it's nice to say that deleting it will solve all your problems. That unfortunately isn't actually true. So then finally, you're gonna say, Dan, why did you buy a diesel engine? Why are you going to all this complexity when a gas engine works and you already know it. And yeah, it's a bit of a funny thing. You're right, it's not the smartest or the most straightforward option, but I have a few reasons to do it. Some of them are personal, some of them I think make sense. My main was that I wanted to get better gas mileage. So with the camper on now, I've driven about 2000 miles and I'm sitting right on 23 miles a gallon. I'm pretty happy with that. That means I'm spending less in fuel Yes, diesel is actually cheaper here than gas and plenty of other places I've been already. And I'm just simply burning less. And as well as that, it means I'm carrying less fuel. So I'm using up less of my payload to carry fuel around. The tank in this is only 18 and a half gallons instead of the 22 gallons in the gas engine. So I get the same range, but I'm carrying less weight to do it. Those are the real main reasons that I did it, or probably the intelligent reasons that I did it. The less intelligent reasons, I simply have always wanted to have a diesel engine vehicle. I've read about them for so long, I've heard about them. I tried to convert my own, which was a spectacular failure. It's something that I've simply wanted for a long time. I'm a pretty stubborn person, and even when it's not necessarily the greatest idea, I go ahead and I do things. And so for me, this is a bit of a learning experience. Maybe in 20 or 50,000 miles, I'm gonna look back and say, this was a terrible idea, you know, the emission system is failing and it's costing me lots of money and I can't take it to interesting parts of the world. Or maybe I'll look back and I'll say, hey, yeah, it was a little bit annoying, but with these precautions and the things I've talked about in this video, you can actually make it work. Which way is that going to go? I genuinely believe we don't know. Not enough people have done it yet. And so for me, I'm the kind of person who wants to learn. I wanna try new things and I wanna see what happens. And on a broader note, you're gonna see more and more of that as I show you more of the build. Some of the decisions I've made here, they're different than what I've done in the past. Not necessarily because I think they're better, partially just because I wanna learn. I wanna see the pros and cons. A really great example, I'm gonna have a diesel heater in this vehicle, I'm going to have hot water in this vehicle, I'm going to have a shower in this vehicle. These are all things I've never had before. Are they worth the added expense? Are they worth the added weight? Are they worth the added complexity? There's kind of only one way to find out. And that's part of the reason I wanted to build this vehicle so I can find out the pros and cons and learn as I go along. And then in the next vehicle coming in, who knows how many years, I'll be able to look back and say, what I had worked well and is worth it. Or I'll say, that was a bad idea. I'm not doing that again. So it's a big learning experience for me.
So if you've stuck around this long, I'd love to get your input. What do you think? Have I made a bad decision by going with a modern diesel? Should I have just kept it simple and got the gas engine? And I know that's worked well for me in the past. Maybe I should have just done that again. Let me know down in the comments, what are your thoughts? Is what I've done here worth it to get an extra few miles a gallon? Or have I made things more complicated than they need to be? And should I have stuck with the gas engine? Stick a comment down below. I do read them all and I will respond to every single one of them. So once again, thanks very much for watching. And as you can see, that is quite a detailed topic. There's a lot that goes into it and a lot to think about the differences between a gas engine or a very modern diesel engine. And so if you'd like to get behind the scenes content, early access, discuss all of these things, we can have a one-on-one -on -one video call to discuss your upcoming trip or your upcoming vehicle build. All of that is available to my supporters over on Patreon and they make all of this content possible. Without them, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. So a huge thanks to those guys. And as always, thanks again for watching. Have fun out there on the road and maybe I'll bump into you.